Okay. Hello. All right. So thank you for tuning in, uh, those here in the flesh, as well as those who are virtually connected. Um, I'm kind of blown away by this topic. In fact, as uh, James knows, it took me quite a long time to get him the slides. I didn't get them to him on time. Um, and it has a lot to do with the implications that we're going to be talking about tonight. First of all, uh, when we talk about the microbiome, uh, it's really a very distracting uh, term because when you really think about the implications of the discovery that we're primarily microbial, um, it really it blows your mind and it, it leads to almost a cosmic kind of implication. So that's why the title of the talk today is on the implications of the microbiome for you know, some macro uh, uh, you know, some topics. So one might ask, you know, what does someone like myself with no particular training in science and sort of the microbiome be talking about uh, such a topic? I, I happen to have spent some time in college uh, studying philosophy, and certainly the question of what is life is a big part of, you know, why I feel uh, obligated to look deep into this topic. Um, but I am actually the microbiome as are, you are, so that's my primary qualification. Um, so. This image is very instructive because that's the Milky Way galaxy within which we are presently on this little speck called the Earth. So the you are here is very uh, literal, in fact. Um, so basically, there are about, what, 400 billion stars in our, in our galaxy? And that's less than the number of microbes that have been identified in the human you know, microbiome. So you know, it's a really profound image because it does reflect back to what essentially we are. On the top right, I don't know if I can get this movie to work. No, I don't think so. Um, is actually the solar system moving through space. And it looks very much like a bacteria and its flagellate projecting it forward. So there are these sort of metaphors or recurrent uh, phenomena that, again, speak to the tie between the cosmic and the sort of microscopic. So uh, I'm a big fan of this metaphor of the global brain because in part we're all right now being connected through it, through the internet. And a lot of what I know today is because I happen to be fixated on Medline, which some of you know is a bibliographic database produced through the National Library of Medicine through our taxpayer money primarily, which contains about 23 million citations now in biomedicine and life sciences. And I've spent literally years in front of a computer, you know, to some physiological detriment, my eyes, for example, uh, just and my brain uh, being irradiated by the LCD, trying to figure out, you know, what does the research say about different topics? And what's so fascinating to me, first of all, is that global brain represents 23 million years of scientific labor as far as PubMed.gov alone. That's like the medical convolution of the global brain. So it's an incredible resource. And it's, you know, use it like Google. Any question you have, throw it into PubMed.gov and see what you retrieve. Um, so when it comes to the microbiome, when I was born in 72, there was one study that was published that's indexable right now for that year on uh, Medline. And then suddenly you see in 2000 sort of a exponential jump to, you know, 78. And just last, what was it? Last year, at about 5,400. So you see this like inflection of the curve that occurred right at the, the in 2000. So we have a very interesting phenomena going on, which is the explosion of data, of course, almost overnight. And it's very um, analogous to the discovery of the quantum of action in, in 1900, which launched uh, the microphysics revolution. You know, sort of quantum mechanics, and the implications of that are so profound as far as our knowledge and technology. So I believe that we have sort of passed through event horizon so that you, we really can't go back. Like what James is speaking to earlier is so profound. I believe that when you look at the object of biomedicine today, you know, we still have this very cadaver-like notion of what the human body is and how we're going to orient ourselves to it. And what's basically happened is that we now have all the published literature, all the extent literature on the body devalidated because it didn't account for the so-called holobiont, which we are, which is, of course, our own genome and all of the genetic contributions of every single microbe that populates us. So approximately 4.5 million genes in the microbiome, and those are protein-coding genes. There's far more genetic information in the dark matter, the RNA. 
um, versus the 23,000 approximately protein coding genes in the human body. So you can see that the subject and object of medicine have completely been transformed and that a lot of the interventions from antibiotics to vaccination to you know, even irradiating people with diagnostic technologies are no longer evidence-based. There's no way to really say that they're safe. Oh, a little bit too quick. Let's see. So it's very much like transitioning from flat universe, you know, sort of flat earth concept. You know, basically, if you really think about what the body is in this realm of the great object, it is truly a piece of flesh, right? It's, it's just basically a piece of meat. And what we're seeing happening is with the discovery of the gut flora, there's a shift to uh, accepting that we're not here alone and there are about two to three pounds in the gut of bacteria um, and viruses and fungi and, and other like helminths. So then we shifted to an appreciation that um, the, it's sort of like going from the uh, geocentric, I'm sorry, the uh, geocentric to the heliocentric uh, model of the universe is that suddenly we see an explosion of our identity, a sort of collapse of the, the ego as far as identifying what is human, what is not, and, and the interdependence. So this is a very profound transition. Okay, so the old narrative, of course, is that there's a tree of life and there's this sort of very slow glacial pace of evolution because, of course, the whole notion is that the code for life and evolution was locked within the nucleus of the cell. But, you know, this it can no longer be maintained because when the holo uh, genome theory of evolution was introduced in 1994, basically that opened up this understanding that throughout evolution, there's been an exchanging of genetic material. So no longer are bacteria way down here and you know, mammals way up here. There's a sort of promiscuity um, that, that is apparent that is going to basically devalidate this whole narrative. So as many of you may know, the Holy Grail again was to identify the primary sequence of uh, genes in the DNA, the protein coding genes, which we know are now only about 2% in number when looking at the total number of genes present. And in 2005, when that first draft was completed, um, they basically said, well, we can't even explain the proteins in the human body. There's at least 100,000, but we only have 23,000 protein coding genes. Obviously, there's no longer any validity to the notion that we can figure out you know, life and even the existence of our body. Uh, through that optic. So, you know, this basically gave rise to the post-genomic era, which has a correlate as far as, you know, the sort of existential condition of our species. Because the thing about the dream of biomedicine is it is in some way reassuring that we're just hunks of flesh and that, you know, there basically is an appreciation for fatalism built into things. Like we don't have control, of course. Um, you know, our genes are inherited from our predecessors and it takes hundreds of thousands of years for them to change. So there's a sort of nihilism and fatalism implied by this model. So as we shift to the post-genomic era, people like Bruce Lipton, um, they pop out of nowhere. Biology of Belief, I'm sure many of you know this title. It's just so profound to think that our choices, our volition, our thoughts, perceptions can gear from the quote top down into our physiology affect gene expression. So the epigenetic revolution was launched in order to try to understand this deficit. Like we can't even understand how our body plan was created. Um, so we have to look beyond the gene to the epigenetic factors. Um, so that was a big change. Uh, so one of the discoveries of course around the same time is the microbial infrastructure of the human genome. The fact that about 8% of our genome sequences are from retroviruses in the same family as HIV, definitely changes, of course, the germ uh, theory when it comes to how viruses are just these evil, lethal vectors outside of us we need to vaccinate against, right? And then there's an appreciation for all the other elements within our genome. Basically, almost it's like this proliferation of you know, jumping genes and these uh, retroposons that are basically like viruses just completely floating around, reproducing, doing something important. The discovery, of course, of the mitochondrial DNA, which is profound. Um, Lynn Margulis, who was a co-developer of the, the, uh, the uh, Gaia hypothesis we'll be talking about in a minute, 
she was one of the uh, individuals to basically flesh out this concept of endosymbiosis, which is that the mitochondria, which power our cells, actually are byproduct of some ancient bacteria uh, entering into the sort of proto eukaryotic cell and becoming, you know, one entity. And it's it's revealed really powerful things about you know our origins. Um, one of them, of course, is that you know our very infrastructure energetically uh, requires you know other germs to operate. So again, totally decomposes that model of the evil germs. The virome, that's the set of chronic in infections, right, viruses that are within your body, like herpes family viruses, even HPV-related viruses, that actually serve fundamental functions in helping to mediate the genes and the environment through altering the phenotype or the expression of those same three billion base pair genes into something useful in the, that interacting with the environment. So a herpes family virus infection can confer great benefits against um, other bacterial infections or reduce the risk uh, or directly help the immune system fight tumors. Um, so for me, this is another one of those profound discoveries that is concomitant with, you know, again, the uh, revolution that I think we are right now immersed in. So this is attributed to Darwin. Um, it's not proven that he actually stated it in these terms, but I really love this quote. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent is the one most adaptable to change. And that's really part of what we're learning about, again, the microbial basis for our existence and life in general, is that it's about resilience conferred by the plasticity, really, offered by this commensal relationship. We have such a vast resource to draw from within the microbiome to respond in real time to changes in our environment, quote, pathogens, uh, new nutrient sources that would be undigestible based on our slowly evolved uh, you know, primary DNA. So I think this also speaks again to a different ethos or morality or worldview, which I think is again a big part of the implication of the microbiome revolution is that we're entering into a new appreciation for interconnectedness, and then this also speaks to an ontologically grounded ethics, which I hope, hopefully I can conclude this discussion with. So quickly, to go over some of you like that, this is like the least viral blog I ever published. I don't know why. I thought it was one of my best. The people thought it looked like sausages were in his body or something. <laughs> but I, I loved it. I, I created it. I'm a graphic designer, but apparently a bad one. So <laughs> this study came up just a while back, which I just love. And I, you know, people who know me are so annoyed because I constantly talk about it. But so there's this big thing, right, about SNPs, right? Single nucleotide polymorphisms, which confer a disadvantage because they can't produce certain things for you or they inhibit certain things. So one of them is you can't produce the active form of folate, the 5-methylene uh, tetrahydrofolate. So it's called the, you know, MTHFR genes that everyone is kind of freaking out about, maybe for good reason. But it turns out that this strain of lactobacillus, which is found commonly in cultured foods like dairy fruits, produces that exact form of folate. So when I saw that, it made so much sense, is that you could have glacial pace evolution of your genome, and then suddenly um, have, have the inability to produce uh, folate be, be completely compensated for by just simply one strain of bacteria in your gut. So it's a really cool example, and we're gonna get to some other cool ones, like superpowers. Uh, this one uh, was sparked by Stephanie Seneff, we were kind of interacting because she had shown me a paper that showed that when they cultivated the guts of certain individuals, they found a wide spectrum of vitamins, as you know. One of them, though, was ascorbate. And I was like, really? I didn't know, think that was possible. You know, because humans supposedly have a genetic defect going back 67 million years ago, where we were incapable of expressing the gene that enables us to convert uh, basically glucose into vitamin C. And this is a very important defect because Linus Pauling, of course, identified this as the explanation for cardiovascular disease, is that the you know, unified theory for him was that inability to produce vitamin C leads to inability to produce collagen to heal the blood vessels and then use cholesterol instead to keep you from bleeding to death, et cetera. So the, the possibility really inspired me because they did find the asorbate, but we didn't find the mechanism. So I did a bunch of Googling and uh, ended up finding this uh, bacteria uh, which has been found to produce vitamin C in the gut. 
gluten-degrading enzyme study. As some of you know, I'm pretty neurotic about gluten, and I've been doing a lot to talk about the dark side of wheat, scaring people, I'm sure, but <laughs> I was part of this meme because like the zeitgeist is everywhere in the world now, there's gluten-free options. I'm even annoyed when I see it, you know? But so anyway, the truth of it is, is that there are 23,000 distinct peptides identified in the modern wheat proteome. So we talk about gluten as a monolithic entity, and it's actually very complex, as, as most of you know. If you can't degrade those peptides, they can be highly immunogenic. And celiac disease, of course, is the worst case example. Parts per million contamination can cause a cascade that could even lead to death, right? So this particular study isolated 94 strains of gluten-degrading uh, bacteria in, in the guts of individuals, some of which could break down the very toxic 33 mer uh, peptide, which we know is primarily implicated in celiac disease. So the point, of course, because I was like, wait a second, like, there's no way that you can adapt to consuming gluten, right? Because we went from the Paleolithic period, which is where the deep historicity of our you know, genetic capability evolved, to the Neolithic transition of eating grains in city-states overnight. Like, how, how the heck would you be able to adjust to that if you can't even produce those enzymes? Well, this helps to show why and how. Uh, degrading toxicants. So as far as um, being able to break down bisphenol A, which is ubiquitous, of course, uh, and all the other bisphenols in that category, there are uh, bacteria that have been identified, for example, in kimchi that are able to do that. So that's really cool because we have created a post-industrial nightmare that I used to freak out about. I still do, but... The, to the toxicants that we've generated, hundreds of thousands, literally, that have never been regulated um, properly or, or risk assessed. Now we know how we could potentially survive this theoretical chemical apocalypse. Um, I haven't seen one degrade plutonium yet, but I think it's possible. Um, <laughs> and actually, there is research on it, helping to accelerate the excretion of metals. So I bet there is some potential. This one's really cool because there's a particular element of the metabolome which is speaking to the point that between a species and its environment which is trying to consume, thanks to the microbiome, are literally thousands of small molecules, some of which act like hormones, like flaxseed has lignin, which turns to enterolactone, enterodiol, which acts like estrogen but blocks the adverse effects. And then you have a compound that's a metabolite of chlorophyll that's been found in a actually pig study, and they're the closest things on the planet to us, actually, to t enable the mitochondria in the cell to capture sunlight and convert it into uh, increased ATP, as well as reducing the reactive oxygen in species that normally occurs when you increase ATP. So it basically proves we're not um, heterotrophs. We don't have to eat other animals. Uh, we are photoheterotrophic. So we're like pl uh, plants, autotrophs. We can take sunlight energy with the help, again, of gut-mediated metabolites like this. This one was mind-blowing. Hopefully I'll have time, but um, basically, they found that the Japanese have within their gut a bacteria that actually captured uh, a marine bacteria's enzyme capabilities that happens to live on nori, you know, which you eat with your sushi. So in other words, the bacteria in their guts were able to take an enzyme that enabled their bodies exclusively to break down all the polysaccharides that are found in the marine environment, which terrestrial evolution only gave us about 20 enzymes. So what they found also was that there's up to 16,000 carbohydrate digesting enzymes in the microbiome. There's only 17 that have been identified that we can produce. So you have 2,000 times more capability to eat potentially an infinite number of different plants in the environment thanks to this you know, mechanism related to horizontal gene transfer. So we have, as our biosphere basically has one, one third of it is bi its biomass is microbes. So you start to kind of appreciate if there's this intermediary of our gut bacteria enabling us to interface with the biosphere, pull out very useful genetic information that would take potentially our species millions of years to evolve, if at all, but just select out of it. So the old paradigm, as I said, collapsing. The basic concept, of course, is that there's a one-way flow of information from the DNA to the RNA to the protein, completely disproven now. So it has a lot to do with the microbiome. Again, through the lens of information, uh, we are, again, 4.5 million genes from the microbiome, 23,000 human. Obviously, that shifts the perspective of what we are and our responsibility to protecting the microbiome, of course. Um, 
So there are a lot of implications I'm not going to be able to get into depth on. But of course, complexification is one of them. It's very overwhelming. Um, we have obviously moved beyond the gene-centric model, uh, the threats to the gene germ theory. I mean, there's global geopolitical agendas, as you know, that are based on things like polio eradication, as if this germ or this virus outside of us alone could destroy humanity if we didn't inject the same virus into the bodies of pe healthy people beforehand. It's absolutely absurd. Um, so, you know, it's like we're dealing with infantilism on a new scale once we apply this context and understand. Um, the ego, of course, you know, having 1% of us be uh, ourselves is not much to work with, you know. So that's one part of it. The informational flows are, are so profound now. When we, reverse transcriptase was identified, we know you can in incorporate, uh, you know, RNA into DNA. So again, that whole model, the holy grail of the central dogma of molecular biology, gone. Non-coding RNAs really are the majority of our genome. So 98% of our genome is composed primarily of these non-coding RNAs. They don't produce proteins, but they're doing a heck of a lot of stuff. This is what they call the dark matter of the genome. Um, and they orchestrate and coordinate the expression of all those other protein coding genes. So we also have what's now known as somatic transfer of information to the germline. The cells in my body, if I were to have another child, um, produce these little nanoparticles containing RNAs that contain information that then can travel to the sperm in my body and alter uh, the phenotype of, of my child in the future. So that totally violates Wiseman's barrier, which stated that you could not transfer information that way. It had to come through the very, again, you know, glacial pace of a vertical transfer through reproduction. Um, and then even more profound is the discovery of prionic information. So the folding of the proteins can convey information, pathological, of course, like you've heard about mad cow disease. But a recent review of yeast shows that 50% of their prions are actually beneficial. So it totally changes the model. You don't even need nucleic acid-based uh, information transfer anymore. It could mean that a food that was grown conventionally, you know, uh, may have energy that's different from the biodynamic and it's transferred horizontally into your body, has the same effects as if it was sort of a gene-based vector. A lot of information, but basically, when you grasp that any protein in your body that exists at this moment, it is in one perfect state of folding, it's called na native confirmation. In order to attain that state, mathematicians have basically uh, figured out that it has to go through an infinite number of degrees of freedom, that it couldn't, it couldn't possibly attain that state, in other words, for the primary sequence of that amino acid to then fold into the complex st structures we're made of. So it brings you to a point of appreciating the mystery and even the intelligence embedded in all things, because it's just not mathematically possible that we even exist. Time scale collapse. So we go from eonic time scale transfer of information, right, through primary DNA, to real time. The implications are profound morally because what it basically means is that anything you do right now here, think, what you expose yourself to, can directly affect future generations. So again, soma body cell to germline transfer. Mechanism's already proven. There is a true statement here. We are in a phase of the return of the goddess. There are a number of ways of describing this. First, uniparental inheritance, or extra nuclear transference of information. Mitochondrial DNA, perfect example, OK? The last or most recent universal ancestor of everyone on this planet was a East African woman 200,000 years ago, approximately, because the mitochondria in her body survived and were passed on to everyone in here has specific uh, genes in it. And what that means is patriarchy is based on surname, surname surrender, right? And the idea that you pass on the father's name to the offspring, and who knows, the maiden name, et cetera. So the concept here is coming back very strongly. And part of it has to do with the microbiome basically being transferred through the mother. And even in utero, there's a transfer of bacteria going on already. So if you think about that, if 99% of what we are is based on the microbiome and the mother is the one who transfers it over, well, obviously her role now takes on a profoundly different um, uh, meaning and significance. So there's an undermining of a very deep thought form that subtends patriarchy. So we're running out of time. The basic principle, <laughs> 
that we emerge to, I believe, and this has to do with the Gaia hypothesis, which is also confirmed now by research on microbial mats, which began at 3.4 billion years ago, is that the homeostatic, you know, almost intelligent, goddess-like balance on this planet between biotic and abiotic sort of atmospheric dimensions happens to occur because of this, you know, this interchange and dance between the microbes and the environment. Um, we are seeing ourselves pass through a intellectual uh, revolution that I think is only beginning to be acknowledged, but the basic concept is this. The natural order has now been described on a very granular level, you know, down to molecular uh, understanding, basically, of how, for example, you don't give intrapartum antibiotics to a, a mother as she's giving birth, because what's going to happen is you've just destroyed that ancient heritage that is the basis for that child's being. So there's an ontoethics that's implied, meaning there's a natural order, and if you respond in a way that isn't in line with that, then there will be a severe adverse effect. So we're coming to a point, I think, of compassion. The word literally means to suffer with. So if the bacteria in my body are not cared for correctly and they're suffering, we're not passing them on to next generation correctly, then we, we suffer. You know, if our environment sprayed with glyphosate constantly, that's going to affect the basis for our microbiome. Then again, that's a violation of the natural order, and there's a transgression that's scientifically validated. So that's the difference. The mythos, the logos are now in congruence and confirming one another. So I know I tried packing a lot in there. I'm a little out of breath. I inhaled a massive dose of uh, jet fuel on the way here, apparently. And uh, I think that's part of it, honestly. So thank you for listening, and uh, hopefully that's been eye-opening. Thanks so much for watching, and for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've created a special free video just for you. It's called The Five Steps to Becoming a Leader in Your Wellness Community, and it'll give you some of the starting points on how to position yourself as the leader in your zip code of your health community. All you have to do is click on the link below.